Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening for our supper club with, hang on, let me catch my breath, nutritionist, author, chef, TV and radio presenter, an all round good egg, Mr. Dale Pivot. I first came across The Medicinal Chef uh, a few years ago actually whilst art directing um, a healthy recipe magazine for Sainsbury's. Uh, the magazine was packed with the usual suspects, the Hemsley sisters, Gizzy, Jamie Oliver, um, and I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of uh, Dale Pinnock. Um, well, that's it, I'm out. <laughs> I'll get you another whiskey if you stay. Um, no, I hadn't actually heard of Dale Pinnock until that point, um, but was really drawn towards his incredible little dishes, but more importantly, his scientific approach to nutrition. Um, I was in the early stages of my own health journey and found Dale's experience and view that medicinal cuisine has the power to influence many aspects of our health, both refreshing and eye opening. In fact, Dale has been in the nutritional industry for over 25 years now, is that right? 26. 26, right. Um, and his nickname, the Medicinal Chef, actually, uh, that he coined in the, what, what would you say, early 90s. 2000s, 90s? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually precedes those aforementioned chefs um, and the recent trends of clean eating and food as medicine. Uh, not that the concept of food as medicine hasn't been around since... Uh, you know, the great Hippocrates graced, uh, graced this planet, but now we have the scientific solid evidence base to understand why eating certain foods help us, or that certain foods poison us. To have a bona fide source of knowledge such as Dale's really is helping to shape the future of culinary medicine. Many of us here in this room, uh, including Dale, um, have been or are on their own health journey and are finding that by opening nature's medicine cabinet and getting to grips with nutrition, um, food has the power to drastically improve your health. Um, to quote Dale, simple yet powerful, a good diet can be a profound tool. Okay, I'm sure you're all eager to hear from the man himself, so without further ado, Mr. Dale Pinnock, everybody. Thank you very much. I'm not going to go on for too long, I'm not going to bore everyone because I know everyone's here for some good food. Hopefully you enjoy the food that um, we've put on for you. So as Ped said, 26 years this year I've, um, I've actually been into nutrition. I ended up on this journey, like many others, due to my own personal health issues. For me, it was acne. From the age, it was about 10 or 11, it was the summer of leaving primary school to go up to secondary school. That time in your life when you suddenly become aware of yourself in relation to your peers. And at that point, my skin exploded during that summer. I looked like I'd been shot in the face with a blunderbuss. It was awful. And over the years, I went to see lots of different specialists, different doctors, dermatologists. I had all of the usual suspect kind of prescriptions as well, from uh, the oral antibiotics, the topical antibiotics, um, vitamin A preparations, this weird thing that looked like a glue pen. That and kind of stick all over your face with Dallas and I think nothing really made much of a difference. Got to 15 years old and I was sat around at my friend's house one night feeling sorry for myself, moping, and his mum said to me, unless you sort out what's going on on the inside, nothing's going to change on the outside. And with that, she thrust into my hand a book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. It's like a full-on 80s cult classic. I mean, you read it now and it's like really sensationalist and nonsensical, but at the time, it was my first exposure to, to, to this kind of book. Obviously, as a 15-year-old boy, I was kind of like, yeah, whatever. But at the same time, I was desperate. I was ready to try absolutely anything. So I read this thing pretty much cover to cover in a weekend, and that light bulb mo moment struck me. I was suddenly aware that, to varying degrees, we can actively engage in our own healthcare. We can be in the driving seat. There's a lot that we can do for ourselves. So I became hooked. I started changing my diet, and yes, my, my skin improved, but the, the, the rest of the journey that I went through was absolutely transformational. You know, my, my energy levels, my mental clarity, my ability to communicate, so many things improved. I just became absolutely hooked. I used myself as a guinea pig. Uh, put myself in hospital twice, but that's a, a conversation for another day. Uh, I'll tell you afterwards when we do the signing. 
I read over a thousand books, just became completely and utterly obsessed with it, and then ended up going to university. I did my first degree in nutrition right here in Kingston. I used to live, I used to live, live in Kingston. So I did that at Penrith Road, then went on to do a second degree in herbal medicine at Westminster, and then did uh, MSc in nutritional medicine at Surrey, Guildford. So quite a... It's always one. <laughs> So quite a long convoluted journey, and I've cooked all of my life as well, literally from the age of about four, since me and my sister were old enough to know what a saucepan was, my mum would like, you know, kind of have us in the kitchen, helping her to prepare the family meal, so always cooked, always been around food, and now, I think the food is the perfect delivery system for the science. Because, yeah, you know, I could stand in front of people day in, day out, and say, well, yeah, if you cut the carbs by 10%, or you might get this outcome, the chances of people actually remembering that and being able to put that information to use are very, very slim. You put it into something practical, like breakfast, lunch and dinner, then all of a sudden it's a framework that people can start to utilise immediately. They know how to change their shopping list, they know how to change the way that they cook, the way that they prepare their meals. All of a sudden you've got information you can use. So that's kind of how I got to this, this point. But then this book that you're getting tonight, this was written because a question that I get asked over and over again. Is there any other nutrition practitioners in the room? Okay, so you guys will, have, will feel my pain on this one. You get members of the general public will say, okay, with all of this misinformation out there, what am I supposed to do? What is the ideal diet? What should I be doing? And for anyone worth their salt, we have one answer. I have not got a clue. I haven't got a scooby, because the science is in its infancy. Nutrition is a science that is filled with contradiction and dichotomy around every single corner, and it's impossible to come up with blanket absolutes for, for everyone. But what we do know is the way in which our modern diet is destroying our health. We know quite a lot about that. So my point of view is, when I ask that question, it's advise people to do the opposite. And then it's a case of deconstructing those areas where our modern diet is destroying our health, flipping it on its head, doing the opposite, and you, you're probably hedging your bets. It's, it's not going to have all the answers, if only. But it's a good place to start. And I think that can be broken down into three areas, and that's why it's called the power of three. Those three areas are, you ready for this? Blood sugar balance, fatty acid balance, and nutrient density. And we can go on some ridiculous, ridiculous rabbit holes with this. I'm not going to do that because you guys are going to be really hungry by the end of it. But blood sugar balance. One of the things that's happened over the last 50 or 60 years, we've been given the message that saturated fats are the devil. We need to cut out fatty foods from our diet, but instead bulk out our diet with a healthy starchy carbohydrates. And tell me if this seems like a normal pattern for people. Maybe someone would wake up in the morning, you know, taking this information on board, and they would have a bowl of cereal and a slice of toast. Then at lunchtime, they might have a sandwich and a packet of crisps. Then in the evening, it might be some mashed potatoes or some pasta or whatever. I'm not demonising any of these foods. There is absolutely nothing wrong with any of these foods whatsoever. The issue is the pattern of consumption and the level of consumption. Why is that a problem? Well, because all of these foods will consistently push up our blood sugar. When blood sugar goes up, sorry for the nutrition people, this is going to be like really, really kind of base level, but when blood sugar goes up, the body responds by secreting a hormone. Insulin, insulin binds to an insulin receptor on your cell, it opens something called a glucose transporter, the cell takes in glucose, it uses that to convert into ATP, which is the energy source that the cell runs on. Okay? That's how things work normally. But cells have a cut-off point. They get, to a, they, they get to a point where they can't take in any more glucose because excess glucose can cause a lot of oxidative stress within the cell, so it naturally shuts the doors at a certain point. They get full. If they're at that point and blood sugar is still high, several other homeostatic mechanisms kick in. Blood sugar that's too high or too low is life-threatening, so our body's got a lot of very, very effective ways of responding to that. So if blood sugar is still high, the cells have closed the doors, the next thing that's going to happen is that excess is going to be sent to the liver. The liver is going to convert it into something called triacylglycerol, otherwise known as triglycerides. Triglycerides are a type of fat. They're a fatty substance. They are a storage form of that energy. And it goes straight around here. 
saving it for a rainy day. This is hardwired into our DNA. When we were living on the plains, we had times of feast and famine. We, we had times where we could gorge, we could put on that little bit extra, then we would have times where we couldn't eat at all, and we could access that stored energy. So it's hardwired in us. This storage form of energy, it gets sent to the adipose tissue, so yes, it can cause you to put on weight, but it gets sent there via the circulation, via the blood. Triglycerides in the blood can lead to inflammatory damage to the cardiovascular system. It can lead to very, very high, dense VLDL, which is a type of LDL cholesterol that's more atherogenic and more likely to actually trigger heart disease, and low HDL. So you've got two things that happen just from having your blood sugar pushed too high. You're starting to put on weight around the abdomen, and your cardiovascular disease risk factors are starting to change. The bets are starting to go against you. So that's the first thing. Fatty acid balance. Now this is one of my areas of obsession. Probably need to get out more and get a social life, I don't know. <laughs> but I obsess over fatty acids. With this advice to cut out saturated fat, we were encouraged to move towards the heart healthy vegetable oils. Who remembers those messages? Especially for certain types of margarines that sponsor marathons and things like that. It's, it's hideous. Because they were an unsaturated fat, the message was that they're going to actually protect us from heart disease. The problem is the fatty acid composition. Now fatty acids are, they're, they're, you can see them as being vitamin-like substances derived from fat. They play lots of different roles in the body, predominantly structural or communicatory roles. So certain fatty acids are involved in maintaining cell membrane structure, maintaining structures in the eyes, those kinds of things. Or they're actually the metabolic building blocks for communication compounds. Now you've got the two main fatty acids of interest. I mean there's, there's quite a few but the, the two that, that are relevant in the things that I'm talking about are omega-6 and omega-3. Probably heard of those. Both of them are absolutely vital. We need both but the amounts of each that we need vary drastically. Okay? Omega-6 we need in very very tiny amounts. Those small amounts that we need are important for neurological health, for hormonal health, they've got some very, very important roles to play, so we can't cut it out completely. But they're so ubiquitous within our diet, it's very easy to get enough. When you take in more than that small amount that you need, the pathway that actually metabolizes it and puts it to good use is saturated, it can't take any more. So it shuttles it down a different pathway. I'm going to park that there for a second, because we need to backtrack. I said they play a role in communication. One of the main things that the fatty acids get turned into are a group of compounds called prostaglandins. Three main types of prostaglandins, series one, series two, and series three. They regulate inflammation. They regulate pain signaling. They can regulate certain types of muscular contraction as well. But the, the main, oh, there's a dog bowl there, Randall. Um, the main thing that they regulate is the inflammatory response. Series one and series three are anti-inflammatory. Series one is quite mild, series three is aggressively anti-inflammatory. Series two is pro-inflammatory. It can switch on and exacerbate the inflammatory response. So, back to the omega-6 story. Once we've taken in that small amount that we, that we need, and that pathway is saturated, the excess gets shuttled down the pathway that manufactures the series two prostaglandin gets converted into something called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid gets converted into the series two prostaglandin. It switches on and exacerbates inflammation. Now, inflammation, it's a double-edged sword. There's certain types of inflammation that are very good for us, so acute inflammation, when you cut yourself, the inflammatory response actually helps to stem the bleeding and to stop kind of bleeding out. That kind of inflammation is really, really good. You need that. The stuff that's problematic is the chronic subclinical inflammation. Subclinical means that your knee just doesn't suddenly swell up. It will only be detectable via a, a blood test, something like you know, CRP, ESR, those kinds of things. We know, I mean, you will find this in any GCSE pathology textbook. This isn't like some kind of wild theory. This is pathology 101, okay? Prolonged Inflammatory changes in tissues can lead to cancers, for example. We know that prolonged inflammation can activate certain genes.
that affects cell replication. We know that cardiovascular disease is, in its essence, an inflammatory condition. When things like triglycerides oxidize, and certain types of cholesterol oxidize, or other physiological events cause inflammatory damage to the endothelium, that's the beginning of the whole heart disease process. So controlling the wrong types of inflammation is of vital importance. In this country, because of our adoption of these types of simple vegetable oils, because of that advice, we are consuming an average of 23 times more omega-6 per day than we need. Because everyone is using vegetable oil. Well, probably not many people in this room, because yeah, into this stuff. But, you know, a lot of people are using cheap vegetable oils, margarines, those kinds of things. So we're taking in far too, too much omega-6. The simple act of reducing your omega-6 intake, taking all those cheap oils, chucking them away, can really, really lower your expression of the, the series 2 prostaglandins. Now, if you add to that, enhancing your omega-3 intake, particularly from sources like oily fish, and this is, this is something that you know, I have to cover. But are there uh, any, any vegetarians or vegans here at all? Okay, so you, you won't need to supplement, because the type of omega-3 that you need, and you don't have to supplement with fish, don't worry, the type of omega-3 that you need are the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids. When people might tell you to eat walnuts and flax and chia. You could eat that until it came out of your ears. You wouldn't get enough of the, the actual long-chain fatty acids that influence inflammation, because the omega-3 fatty acids, they're a whole family of fatty acids. In plants, they exist in the form of ALA. That has to go through a lot of conversion to actually be turned into these ones that we need. Get a supplement derived from algae, and that will cover it. So, but for everyone else, oily fish. Oily fish or marine-derived supplements for those long-chain omega-3 fatty acids. That simple thing, reducing omega-6, increasing omega-3, can have a really profound imp impact on inflammation. So already we're seeing how those two simple changes, managing blood sugar more effectively by adopting a more low glycemic diet, can influence things like abdominal weight gain, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but then obviously increased risk of things like type 2 diabetes in the long run as well by constantly pushing blood sugar up. By manipulating our fatty acid intake, we can, treat, we, we can directly influence long-term inflammation. So those two things, those are the first two, two points. And then the final thing, nutrient density. So many of us are reliant on convenience foods. We're just, you know, we're like a ping and ding generation. And a lot of people's diets are devoid of micronutrients. So we, we will absolutely replete on the macronutrients. People who have no issues with macronutrients whatsoever, the proteins, fats and carbohydrates, we have absolutely got those covered. But the micronutrients are the things that so many people are lacking. Micronutrients being vitamins, minerals, trace elements, phytochemicals and antioxidants, those kinds of things. These are biochemical facilitators. In the body, they either make something happen, or they make something that makes something happen. So if you don't meet your quota of these micronutrients, even in the short term, you can start to create some serious problems for yourself. So looking for any kind of opportunity to get some fresh stuff in. Whether it's just, you know, I, I should imagine like most of us are eating a great fresh diet, but for a lot of people out there, even if it's something as simple as having a nice dense side salad with one meal, or snacking on fruit between meals, something as simple as that, getting more fresh stuff in, you're getting a more broad intake, I mean, yeah, from this menu, yeah, it's smashing it a broad intake of these micronutrients. So look, I mean, it's obviously a very, very simplified answer to give to people when you get that question, what should we be doing? But this is just a deconstruction of the way in which our modern pattern of eating is affecting us negatively. So if we flip it on its head and try and do the opposite by adopting those simple changes, we can actually address a huge amount of issues to, to varying degrees. So yeah, hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight to uh, what's in the book. And on that note, I'll give the, the mic back to Ped, and um, yeah, you guys can enjoy some, some great food. I will, be mi I will be milling around, so you can ask me some questions, but we'll be doing a Q&A at the end as well. And, you know, when we sort of do the sign-in and stuff, you can ask things as well. Okay, lovely. Okay, there you go. Come here.